Perhaps the greatest example of Jefferson in this mode is the Louisiana Purchase, which brings us to uh, a new map for you all. As you recall from earlier lessons or from your own American history, it's important for you to know, the original United States, as per the Peace of Tra Paris of 1783 that ends the American Revolution, is Spanish Florida to the south, Atlantic Ocean to the east, Great Lakes to the north, and the Mississippi River to the west. Now in our previous lesson, we had talked about the fact that we had fought and struggled and sought diplomatically, we had fought at least, fought hard with the Spanish to negotiate a treaty that gave us the so-called right of deposit in New Orleans. This was the right for Americans to take their cargoes and goods down river and drop them off at the port of New Orleans without paying any taxes or fees and then transfer them to ocean going vessels to have that commerce in the outside world. In a nation without a comprehensive railroad or interstate or road network yet, that's huge because it's just too difficult to get goods over those mountains for the entire western half of the country. This is the dominant political issue and need of the entire western half of the United States. Jefferson was aware though that whoever, in his view, whoever owned Louisiana ever, as long as it was the United States, was going to be the permanent enemy of the United States because they would always be in a position to shut that off like a water spigot and choke off that trade at their leisure if they so chose. Additionally, we could have an emergent hostile power just one river away from us. As long as the Spanish had owned Louisiana, Jefferson had no had no real issue. He was unhappy about the fact that we didn't own New Orleans, but it was what it was. However, as the French Revolution moves on, eventually they consolidate power under Napoleon Bonaparte. To take you back to world history for a moment, Napoleon then proceeds to defeat militarily many of the nations of Europe who are fighting against the French Revolution, declares himself dictator or emperor at some point, and then moves on to conquer those nations, or many of them on the continent of Europe, including their colonial possessions. Napoleon conquers Spain, and when he does so, and achieves effective rule over Spain, Spain transfers Louisiana from their territory to being French territory. Spain was sort of, as we saw it, a weak and fading colonial power. They had been since uh, 1588, the Spanish Armada battle. France, as the emerging superpower of the European continent, now possesses New Orleans, and now is we've got a major European power, a dynamic, dynastic European power, right on our western border. Jefferson sees this as both an economic and national security threat to the United States. As such, he sends ambassadors to attempt to purchase Louisiana, or purchase New Orleans rather, the city at the port of New Orleans, so that we could eliminate this threat to our ability to trade on a worldwide basis from the western half of the U.S. Napoleon, because of failed ventures in Central America and South America and in the West Indies, rather, in the West Indies, and also his desire to consolidate his power in Europe and focus his energies on war with his primary enemy, Britain, decides to divest himself of his North American holdings. He sells Louisiana outright, not just New Orleans, but the entire territory for $15 million, which winds up being in many ways the bargain, not just deal, not just the century, the deal, the millennium. It's only once every thousand years a bargain like this comes along. Now this presents Thomas Jefferson with the most interesting and ironic of problems to deal with. Jefferson snaps it up and buys this land for pennies, pennies an acre for what he's paying for with this $15 million. But here's the catch, here's the thing. The Constitution never explicitly mentions that the government of the United States, that the executive branch, has the power and authority to make negotiated land purchases to add to the overall territory of the country. So for Jefferson to do this, what, what's it got to be his political reasoning? What's it got to be? Well, you guessed it. He has to use the necessary and proper clause, the elastic clause of the Constitution. Do you see the irony here? A guy who comes into office saying that the government that governs best governs the least has to now apply the elastic clause, the necessary and proper clause, to stretch the power of the federal government to do things that that government could not explicitly do before he did them. So it's a vast turnaround, and you could argue that Jefferson at this point sells his political soul and becomes a loose constructionist. Now the question is, why did he do it? Answer is, it was just too too fantastically good of a deal, the deal of the millennium, too fantastically good of a bargain for him to pass up. It solves all of his problems. We gain New Orleans for right of deposit. We get a major European power off our western border, taking away, eliminate the national security threat. And we essentially double the size of the country. 
all for a minimal increase to the national debt during this time period. That was the irony too. Jefferson added to the national debt to do this and the Democratic Republicans are all for paying down the debt. The curious thing is who opposes this then? It's amazing how ideologies flip when you're not in charge anymore. The Federalists, remember them? They did not want Western lands to be turned into this land for the yeoman farmer. And that was Jefferson's dream. Jefferson said by buying this, he was going to guarantee generations of Americans that small little independent yeoman farm that they could all have and be true independent landholders. Remember the Eastern concentrations of authority and power, the Federalists, did not want this. It was going to draw people off from their states to go and become these little yeoman farmers as opposed to leaving them with a big labor pool for the emergent commercial and uh, producing markets of the Northeast. And the Jeffersonians know that this is going to be fantastically, or I'm sorry, the Federalists know that this is going to be very popular if Jefferson does it. And anything that's popular is going to guarantee his re-election. The Federalists don't want that. So in a curious role reversal, the Federalists are in Congress complaining, this violates the Constitution. This is against strict construction. You can't do this. It's not written in the Constitution to do this. Which shows you something. Think like a historian. It shows you that people often shift their ideology. And this will not be the last time we see this in American history. Politicians will shift their ideology based upon what is politically convenient for them to do and where they stand. Do they hold the levers of power in their hands or are they on the outside seeing somebody else holding those levers? And so you see the strict and loose interpretation of the Constitution flips between the two parties on this issue. So the national consequences is it sets up the United States nicely by limiting that superpower threat from the French and also opens up this entire region. By the way, notice who is not consulted, which follows a long-standing pattern we've seen for many lessons now. No dialogue with the Native Americans in that region at all. So this was a transference of goods that would be not unlike you going into your neighbor's house and then telling all of your friends to come over and take whatever they wanted out of the house because you're going to give it to them. You're really not in a position to be empowered to do that, but you're doing it just the same. This shows you how the Native Americans, from the point of view of all the great powers, the Americans, and the United States, and all the great powers of Europe, they weren't even there. They were kind of invisible even though they were there. They had no, had no claim, had no role. This is a long-standing pattern we'll see continue throughout the 19th century, the 1800s, as we go forward. So to establish claim to this region, to establish claim to this region, Jefferson then sends Lewis and Clark on a exploration mission that's both scientific, military, and diplomatic in nature, looking for what Henry Hudson looked for way back in Lesson 1 or Lesson 2, way back in August of your American History course. Sends them to try to find the Missouri River to see if going along the Missouri River will actually lead to a passage straight through the Pacific Ocean. We know at this point it's probably not going to dump us right off in India or the Indies, but is there a straight way through to the Pacific Ocean? Lewis and Clark get to the Continental Divide and they discover there what you and I all now know, there is no passage. And at that point, a 400-year-old dream that begins with European great powers in the 1400s, that dream dies. And it's once and for all definitively settled, there is no passage. However, it's an exploration mission of uh, scientific discovery, also uh, a military kind of exploration in terms of establishing claim to an area, and a diplomatic mission in terms of introducing ourselves as the the new, the new kind of kid who's going to be a player in this area to all the tribes that reside through that region. Now the final, turn, the final thing of Jefferson's administration I wanted to talk about in, in the domestic sense was going to be the abolition of the slave trade, which Jefferson himself did not do. This was on a timer and the timer had finally run out. And this is important for you to remember for multiple choice questions that ask about it. In 1808, based on the Constitutional Convention of 1787, after the 20 year window, the window for the slave trade closes. Any slave trade with the exception of slavery in Washington, D.C., the District of Columbia slaves could still come in. And there were certainly going to be slaves that were smuggled into the United States, uh, slave carriers who had smuggled them in. But in a legal sense, Americans bo America's borders were closed to any further importation of slaves. So the use of slaves in the United States or any growth in the population will be internal due to natural increase from this point forward.